Good evening. All right, everybody take your seats. I am so delighted to be able to welcome you to the 186th meeting of the AAAS, the American Association for the Advancement of Science. I'm Peggy Hamburg, chair of the AAAS Board of Directors and Foreign Secretary of the National Academy of Medicine. And it's really a pleasure to see you all in this beautiful city. Raining, yes, but beautiful and a wonderful host for this uh, terrific meeting. This meeting is really a great opportunity for us to come together as a community dedicated to science and to all the myriad ways in which science matters. An opportunity to learn, to share ideas, discuss challenges before us, and how best to make a difference, and hopefully to have some fun. I'd like to acknowledge that we're on indigenous land, the traditional territories of the Coast Salish people, which touched, touched the shared waters of all the tribes and bands within the Suquamish, Tulaypilat, and Muckleshoot nations. We're deeply appreciative for the tribes and native people who founded and remain important parts of this community. Before we begin tonight's program, we'd also like to recognize the members of the American Junior Academy of Sciences, or AJAS. And this is the only national honor society recognizing America's high school students for outstanding scientific research. The winners of statewide competitions are nominated to represent their states at the national AJAS convention, which is held in conjunction with our annual meeting. Competition winners will present their posters tomorrow in the Expo Hall, and I hope that you'll all take the time to meet and encourage these young scholars. And at this time, I'd like to ask the AJAS students to stand and be recognized. Thank you very much. Glad to see how many of you there are. AAAS is committed to providing a safe and productive meeting environment that fosters open dialogue in the exchange of scientific ideas, promotes equal opportunities and treatment for all participants, and is free of harassment and discrimination. Simply put, harassment of any kind has no place at this or any scientific gathering, and we will not tolerate it. By registering at this meeting, you agree to abide by the AAAS Meeting Code of Conduct. It's available at meetings at AAAS.org slash policies um, on the uh, meeting mobile app, and it's also in the printed pocket guide if you want to take a look. Over the course of the next three days, if you or someone you know feels that they've been the target of inappropriate or harassing behavior, AAAS offers a quiet and discreet safe space where you can confidentially and free of charge utilize the services of a trained professional who will offer information, emotional support, and assistance in finding resources and deciding next steps. You do not need to file a formal report to use these services, and they're open to anyone for any reason. The safe space is located in room 310 on the third level of the convention center, and it will be available between 8 a.m. and 5 p.m. each day. Let's join together as a community and commit to no one being made to feel out of place, unwelcome, or harassed at this meeting for who they are, where they come from, or what they believe. It's also critically important for us to recognize that the AAAS annual meeting is a place where people of all backgrounds are welcome and their perspectives are valued. Science depends on openness, transparency, and the free flow of ideas and people. AAAS has spoken out against limitations on the ability of scientists to communicate with their peers and with the public, particularly through participation at meetings at this, such as this one. 
Simply put, continued restriction on this type of collaboration will harm the scientific enterprise. AAAS is launching a new initiative, Science Beyond Borders, supported by the generous support of Jan and Marika Vilcek and the Vilcek Foundation, which will engage the STEM community directly to highlight the contributions of foreign-born scientists to the scientific enterprise in the U.S., seeking to understand and make visible the challenges faced by immigrant scientists in the U.S. and understand whether, how, and why international collaborations are shifting in the face of current political and public policy shifts. We want to hear directly from you. So please visit the website on the screen for more information. Is it on the screen? Um, OK. Uh, we want you to be able to visit the website uh, so that you can get more information on how you can participate in this important new endeavor. As we gather here, some of our international colleagues have been unable to join us because of restrictive government policies, while others have been affected by a tragic course of events. There was a sizable delegation from China that had registered to attend and participate in the annual meeting. As the events in China related to the novel coronavirus have unfolded in recent weeks, AAAS worked with our counterparts at the Chinese Embassy and counterpart organizations in China to determine the status of the participants and if they were located in areas directly affected by travel restrictions to arrange for their remote participation in our meeting to the greatest extent possible. We value the diversity of our participants in our programs and are committed to doing all we can to preserve the important perspectives that are offered through international participation and collaboration. Our thoughts and concern remain with our friends, colleagues, and collaborators in China and around the world, and we express our gratitude to the researchers, clinicians, and public health officials who are on the front lines of this epidemic. It's wonderful that we are all here together, though, and to see so many new and familiar faces in the audience tonight. Many of us traveled a great distance to be here. In that regard, AAAS recognizes the environmental impact of our and other scientific gatherings, and we're committed to mitigating the impact. Being together over the next several days is a unique and unparalleled opportunity that as of yet cannot be recreated virtually. We hope that each of you, though, makes the most of your time here to reconnect with existing friends and colleagues, connect with new ones, and discover the promise of interdisciplinary collaboration for advancing the scientific endeavor. The AAAS annual meeting aims to be a zero-waste event, leaving no landfill trace of our activities, and whenever possible, leaving the community in better condition than we found it. We're making concerted efforts this year by collecting data and setting baselines against we'll assess our progress in the future. To do this all, participants from AAAS uh, really need to help us in this collective effort to green this meeting. We're working cooperatively with all of our meeting venues, including here in the convention center and the meeting hotels, to track energy use and waste disposal. After the conference, you'll receive a survey to report on your meeting experience. As part of this survey, we'll ask you questions about your own eco efforts. So please help us collect as much data as possible. Reducing our collective footprint will require everyone's active participation. And suggestions to reduce your own footprint while here in Seattle are available in the meeting mobile app. So a lot to think about as we start our meeting. And it's now my honor to be able to present two of AAAS's most prestigious awards. Each year, AAAS recognizes significant contributions to science and the public's understanding of science. First, the Philip Haig Abelson Prize. Its namesake was the editor-in-chief of science from 1962 to 1984. A 1987 recipient of the National Medal of Science, 
Abelson had a long and distinguished career as a physical chemist at the Carnegie Institution in Washington, including seven years as its president. The Abelson Prize was established by the AAAS Board of Directors in 1985 and is awarded annually either to a public servant in recognition of sustained exceptional contributions to advancing science or to a scientist whose career has been distinguished both for scientific achievement and for other notable services to the scientific community. Let's find out more about the incredible career of this year's recipient. The Philip Haig Abelson Prize honors an individual for groundbreaking contributions to science in America, either as a public servant or a scientist or engineer with a distinguished record of scientific achievement and other notable services to the community. This year, we honor Chad A. Merkin of Northwestern University for his extraordinary contributions to chemistry and nanoscience, national service and science policy leadership, and support of diversity in science. Merkin is the director of Northwestern's International Institute for Nanotechnology and the George B. Raffman Professor of Chemistry, Medicine, Material Science and Engineering, Biomedical Engineering, and Chemical and Biological Engineering. He is one of the most cited chemists in the world and recognized as a nanoscience pioneer. Merkin invented and developed a series of scanning probe-based nanolithography techniques marking a fundamental change in the way researchers think about synthesizing miniaturized chemical and biological systems and engage in high-throughput material synthesis and discovery. He is also known for his invention and development of spherical nucleic acids, nanostructures that form the basis of a new type of chemistry where particle atoms and DNA bonds can be used to engineer colloidal crystals. In addition, Merkin uses spherical nucleic acids in high-sensitivity biodetection schemes, potent gene regulation, and advanced immunology therapies as well. Merkin is also known for his invention and development of on-wire lithography and coaxial lithography and contributions to supramolecular chemistry and nanoparticle synthesis. This prolific scientist has published more than 750 papers and over 1,200 patent applications. Of these applications, over 350 have been issued. The inventions and processes coming out of his laboratory have resulted in his founding of multiple companies that have commercialized over 2,000 products worldwide. Merkin is also one of a precious few elected to all three branches of the U.S. National Academies, Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine. On the national policy front, Merkin has advised multiple U.S. presidents, the American Chemical Society, the Gordon Research Conferences, and the National Academy of Sciences. As a champion of diversity, he has trained over 270 students and postdoctoral associates. Of these, over 110 are now faculty leaders at the world's top universities. Over a third of his mentees have come from underrepresented groups. Merkin's a distinguished chemist who's made profound contributions through his groundbreaking research, science policy leadership, and support of diversity. Chad A. Merkin, recipient of the 2020 Philip Haig Abelson Prize. So it is now my great pleasure to be able to present the 2020 Philip Haig Abelson Prize to Chad A. Merkin, Director of the International Institute for Nanotechnology and the George B. Raffman Professor of Chemistry, Professor of Chemical and Biological Engineering, Professor of Biomedical Engineering, Professor of Material Science and Engineering, and Professor of Medicine at Northwestern University. He said, I thought he had more titles than anyone I know, and he said, a lot of faculty meetings. <laughs> um, next, the Newcomb Cleveland Prize. AAAS's oldest award, the Newcomb Cleveland Prize, was established in 1923 with funds donated then anonymously by Newcomb Cleveland, and was originally called the AAAS thousand dollar prize until Mr. Cleveland's death in 1951. The prize is awarded to the author or authors of an outstanding research article or report published in science. Today the award bestows a cash prize of 25,000. 
The prize has been generously supported over many years by the Fodor Family Trust. Stephen Fodor, who recently received the prize, uh, well, back in 1992, I guess, um, as, established an endowment in 2019 to sustain it in perpetuity. So thank you, Stephen, for that generous gift. And let's find out now about this year's winning paper and its outstanding researcher authors. The AAAS Newcomb Cleveland Prize, our oldest award, recognizes an outstanding paper published in the research articles or report sections in the journal Science each year. The winning paper is chosen based on the quality of the scholarship, innovation, presentation, likelihood of influencing the field, and wider interdisciplinary significance. This year, we present the prize to the research paper entitled, Transgenic Metaresium Rapidly Kills Mosquitoes in a Malaria Endemic Region of Burkina Faso published in Science on May 31st, 2019. The paper was an NIH-funded international collaboration between researchers at the University of Maryland Department of Entomology and IRSS Center Miraz in Burkina Faso. The team's goal was to develop a fungal biotechnology to combat mosquitoes that carry malaria. Malaria is a huge threat in the West African nation, with over 10 million confirmed cases annually in a population of about 20 million. Decades of insecticide use has led many mosquito populations that carry malaria parasites to become resistant to it. In response, scientists have intensified efforts to genetically modify mosquitoes and other organisms that can help effectively control them and eradicate malaria. The study showed that a naturally occurring fungus engineered to deliver an insect-specific toxin to mosquitoes safely eliminated 99% of them in a screen-enclosed, simulated village setting in Burkina Faso. The fungus, called Metaresium pingshiense, is a naturally occurring pathogen that infects insects in the wild and kills them slowly. In the mosquito's case, a fungal spore lands on the outside of the insect, then penetrates the interior until it reaches its blood, called hemolymph. Within the hemolymph, the spore grows a protein shell that makes it invisible to the insect's immune system and multiplies as a budding yeast-like fungus, but it still does not kill mosquitoes fast enough to control them effectively. To address this, researchers engineered metaresium to produce a toxin called hybrid, derived from an Australian spider's venom, which kills mosquitoes more rapidly than they can breed. Using transgenic techniques, the researchers make the fungus produce the hybrid toxin only once it has reached the hemolymph and donned its invisibility cloak. They trialed its effectiveness for controlling mosquitoes in near-field conditions in Burkina Faso in a setup called Mosquitosphere. Inside this 6,550 square foot structure, multiple screen chambers contained experimental huts, plants, small mosquito breeding pools, and calves that served as their food source. During the study, mosquitoes exposed to transgenic fungi died much more quickly and in larger numbers than those exposed to wild fungi, and the population collapsed within 45 days. The judges were particularly impressed with the team's ability to successfully establish the right environmental conditions, including vegetation, breeding sites, and blood sources needed to sustain a mosquito population. Testing the engineered metaresium under the controlled yet realistic conditions of mosquitosphere is a key step before launching critical epidemiological field studies. Transgenic metaresium rapidly kills mosquitoes in a malaria endemic region of Burkina Faso, recipient of this year's AAAS Newcomb Cleveland Prize. So it's now my pleasure to present the 2019 AAAS Newcomb Cleveland Prize for Transgenic Metarizium Rapidly Kills Mosquitoes in the Malaria Endemic Region of Burkina Faso. And representing this paper's authors are Brian Lovett of the University of Maryland College Park, Etienne Bilgo of Institut de Recherche en Sciences de la Santé, Centre Miraz, Abdullaye, Du Fayate of Institut de Recherche en Sciences de la Santé, Centre Miraz, and Raymond Saint Leger of the University of Maryland College Park.
Well, they wrote a great paper, but they didn't stand in the right order for their prizes. Um, so congratulations to tonight's winners. And um, please join us each evening for additional award presentations. The development of the exceptional multidisciplinary program you'll enjoy over the next three days has been guided by AAAS President Stephen Chu, who will deliver his presidential address very shortly, along with the truly dedicated and amazing annual meeting program committee that works to put this meeting together year round. Thanks to Steve and the committee for their excellent work this year, and we really, truly do have an exciting program. We're also honored to have in attendance tonight our honorary local co-chair. I'm not going to get this right, and she taught me how to say it. Um, Anamari Kause, president of the University of Washington, which is really so generous in hosting uh, us uh, for this meeting and being our host university. Um, I'd, I'm, I'm pleased that I'll be able to invite President Kause to the podium. Let me first tell you just a little bit about her, her background. In 2015, she became the 33rd president of the University of Washington, one of America's premier public universities, where she's also professor of psychology and American ethnic studies with secondary appointments in gender, women, and sexuality studies, and in the College of Education. Prior to be na being named UW's president, she served for four years as its provost and executive vice president overseeing the education, research, and service missions of the university's schools, colleges, and other academic units. A member of the UW faculty since 1986, President Kause has, been, has also previously served as chair of American Ethnic Studies, chair of psychology, and executive vice provost, and dean of the College of Arts and Sciences. She was raised in Miami after emigrating with her family from Cuba and President Kause completed her undergraduate studies in English and psychology at the University of Miami. She holds a PhD in psychology with a concentration in child clinical and community psychology from Yale. She maintains an active research program focusing on adolescent development with a special emphasis on at-risk youth. She's a strong advocate for women and underrepresented minorities in STEM fields, and she remains active in the classroom and continues to teach and mentor undergraduate and graduate students. For her teaching, scholarship, and advocacy, uh, Professor Kause has received numerous awards, including the Dalmas Taylor Distinguished Contribution Award, the Louis Fernando Esteban Public Service Award, the James M. Jones Lifetime Achievement Award of the American Psychological Association, the Grace Hopper Exemplary Leadership Award, and the Distinguished Contribution Award from the Society for Community Research and Action. In 1999, she was awarded the Distinguished Teaching Award, the highest honor of the University of Washington. Um, and uh, it, she was recognized, of course, for the work with students in and outside the classroom. So please join me in recognizing and welcoming Pre President Kause. Gosh, what a lovely crowd. You look absolutely fabulous. Thank you so much, Peggy, and hello to so many colleagues and friends, um, some of which I know and some of which I look forward to getting to know. On behalf of the University of Washington and the City of Seattle, I'm honored to welcome you. And I particularly want to thank um, the board and the staff of, a of AAAS for bringing everybody here to my city that has actually been my home for over 30 years. Um, it's great to have you all here. Um, the AAAS annual meeting is, like, is really unlike any other in its diversity of scholarship, fields of expertise, and the professions and perspectives of the people who take part. But for all of our differences, we're united by one very important thing, curiosity. 
Curiosity is intrinsic to humanity, the desire to understand our world and ourselves, and to learn new things is a, straight, is a trait that offered humans' earliest ancestors an evolutionary leg up. I just spent, actually, the last week in the Galapagos and was thinking a lot about evolution, about what it is that makes humans um, so distinct. And that curiosity, the drive to know, is absolutely central to it. Curiosity is essential to our continued survival, an endlessly renewable fuel that feeds exploration, discovery, and innovation. We share the conviction that by combining curiosity with rigor and teamwork, it allows our species to move forward, at times by inches and at times by leaps and bounds. Now, I don't want to feed into some of the stereotypes that you might have of the Pacific Northwest and sound too woo-woo, so to speak, but it is my absolute and firm belief that the human imagination unfettered will take us to important places, even if we don't know what those places are when we're starting our work. The power of basic research is absolutely critical. But at the end of the day, we also want to apply that knowledge to serving the greater good. And that desire to wed that basic research, that curiosity, that imagination to a meaningful purpose is not just something that infuses the University of Washington, but that really you will see across the people and organizations in this very special part of the world, the Pacific Northwest. We're thrilled to be able to welcome you to this hub of research and innovation. And I hope that you find yourself making new connections that you never expected before you came here. This region has an unparalleled constellation of nonprofits, NGOs, and businesses invested in a healthier future for our people and our planet. This concentration, both on our UW campus and off, was the catalyst for the launch of our population health initiative four years ago. I think all our universities draw on our regions, on those things that are special around us as we put together initiatives, as we make our mark on the world. And for us, in this particular part of the world, population health is really what made the most sense. The Population Health Initiative was created to leverage the incredible nexus of talent and resources to help all people live longer and healthier lives. And at UW, this is very central to our work, but we also want to be a convener of others that are involved in doing this work. The UW is home to outstanding health sciences. We have schools of medicine, nursing, pharmacy, dentistry, public health, and social work. Um, but improving population health also takes effort, experts in law, in information sciences, in public policy, in arts, computer sciences, engineering, communication, journalism, and even a few psychologists. Um, it really is, I mean, the important thing is that health is a lot more than just about the absence of disease, although, of course, that's central. Healthy, thriving people need clean, safe living spaces, economic and social justice, and no single organization can create that future, but together we can. I hope that some of you come and visit our campus. I know that some of you will, and you'll notice a brand new building coming up. Um, later this year, we will be opening the Hans, the Hans Rosling Center for Population Health, and it has special places for visiting scientists because we want it to be a real convener of people across disciplines and across universities. It'll serve as a new hub near the center of campus for collaborations across the university, state, nation, and world. And we hope that some of you will end up spending some time here in this visit, but more so later. Um, because I really hope that we can work together to improve health and well-being of people across the globe. 
um, I can't think of a more urgent problem. The challenges we face are daunting and global in scale. Climate change, pandemics, technology that threaten to undermine our democratic values. But history shows that we're equal to the challenge. Vaccines, clean energy technology, huge advances in computer power have already changed the world. And the next great leap forward for humanity could well be in this room. Um, I love the fact that we have so many senior and junior and budding sciences all together. It's this intergenerational and interdisciplinary mix that I think will lead to that next innovation and that next leap forward for humanity. Research advances, new cures and treatments, informed policy, technology that will help us connect here on Earth or throughout the cosmos. Whatever unique story led each of us to our professions, to this room, to this moment today, we share the conviction that research and innovation can better humanity. When we envision tomorrow's Earth, we have the privilege of optimism. We know firsthand that scientific discovery can not only show us the future, but can change it for the better. The power and responsibility for making that change lies in our hands, begins today, right here. I look forward to the next three days and seeing what we can take from here to change the world, to change our lives. Thank you so much for inviting me to say a few words and for inviting us to be your host. Thank you. Well, I, I think that those words are inspiring. What a wonderful way to get us uh, started for this annual meeting. And we all can use an infusion of optimism. Um, and as the, the good teacher that you are, you taught me a new word. Whoa, whoa. Um, so now I'd like to thank uh, our sponsors. We've just heard from one of our important and generous sponsors, our host university uh, of Washington. But I also want to recognize and thank them for their support of this annual meeting, the European Commission, the UK Research and Innovation, Johnson & Johnson Innovation, and Microsoft. So thank you all very much. And tonight's program in particular is made possible by generous support from Johnson & Johnson Innovation, a longtime partner of AAAS. The global healthcare company shares AAAS's commitment to demonstrating that science is everywhere, that it impacts our lives in every imaginable way. Johnson & Johnson is working on many fronts to do this, including through its multifaceted Champions of Science initiative to convene and catalyze Champions of Science and engage people of all generations and backgrounds to see the unlimited opportunities that science can bring. We're looking forward to hearing from Seema Kumar, Johnson & Johnson's Vice President of Innovation, Global Health and Policy Communications. She had originally planned to be with us this evening, but unfortunately for us, Seema has been called back to New Jersey to help manage Johnson & Johnson's ongoing response to the novel coronavirus outbreak. She's responsible for maintaining the company's leadership position in innovation and global health and is herself a tremendous champion of science. She can be seen around the world talking about the importance of science and technology in creating healthier and better futures for us all. Seema and her colleagues at J&J &J believe that today more than ever, science needs champions who engage society in a broad way. And we're grateful that they've recognized AAAS as an important collaborator in this work and for the company's ongoing and expanding partnership and support. So let's take a few minutes to hear from Seema, who's joining us on the big screen. Hello, everyone. I'm sorry I couldn't join you in person at AAAS, 
due to some urgent priorities related to Johnson & Johnson's work on the coronavirus response. But thank you for letting me share a few thoughts via video. I'm very pleased to be able to address a room full of champions of science. Multiple surveys have shown that over the past two decades, trust in facts has eroded among the general public. This truth decay, which blurs the lines between opinion and fact, manifests as declining trust in respected sources of fact and impacts how people view science. But as all of you know, science touches our lives in so many different ways. From the phone each of us has in our pocket to the medicines we have in our bathroom cabinets. In the last few weeks, science has once again come to the forefront as the world scrambles to deal with the emergence of a new pandemic threat, the coronavirus. People turn to science in times of anxiety and uncertainty because it brings hope. It helps us understand our world, and it is a source of tangible solutions. At Johnson & Johnson, we've mobilized a multi-pronged response to the coronavirus outbreak by working together with multiple partners to get to a vaccine within the shortest possible time. Days after getting the coronavirus sequence, scientists at Johnson & Johnson started biological work to make a vaccine, and I'm happy to tell you that we're making rapid progress. We hope to start animal experiments in the next several weeks, and in parallel, we're working on evaluating upscaling of the vaccine in order to start clinical trials as soon as possible later this year. Using the same technology created for the development and manufacture of Johnson & Johnson's Ebola vaccine, and to construct the Zika, RSV, and HIV vaccine candidates, we aim to make several million doses of a vaccine for the coronavirus before year end. We're also working with global partners to screen our antiviral libraries to accelerate discovery of potential treatments. This kind of response has been possible because of unprecedented collaboration among the public and the private sectors, among scientists from all corners of the globe, and also because of the lessons the world learned in the aftermath of the West Africa Ebola outbreak of 2014. The emergence of the coronavirus reinforces once again the urgent need for continued investment in science and technology, for strengthening of healthcare infrastructure, as well as the need to improve public understanding and trust in science. That's why Johnson & Johnson supports programs like the AAAS Mass Media Fellows Program and our own Champions of Science initiative, because we believe we need more accurate reporting and engaging storytelling about science in order to continue to help people understand and support science and innovation. 2020 kicks off the decade of action for the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. To make the progress that the world needs and to live healthier, happier lives, we need more citizens to support action on issues such as ending poverty and hunger and addressing climate change. We need people to understand that science offers a path for reaching these goals and how doing so can change the trajectory of health for everyone everywhere. Science must come to the rescue and we need champions of science like you to make it happen. I hope you'll accept this challenge because with your commitment, we can engage people of all generations and backgrounds to help make the world a healthier place. Thank you. Well, I wish she could have been with us, but it's wonderful to know that she's hard at work addressing critical issues of the application of science to very pressing real world problems. And it's now time for our AAAS President's Address. And it's my great pleasure to be able to introduce our AAAS President, Stephen Chu. Steve Chu is the William R. Kennan Jr. Professor of Physics and Professor of Molecular and Cellular Physiology at Stanford University. Dr. Chu is a very distinguished scientist who's held numerous significant positions and can claim a host of impressive accomplishments. He's published over 280 papers in atomic and polymer physics, biophysics, biology, bioimaging, batteries, and other energy technologies. He holds 15 patents and an additional nine patent disclosures or filings since 2015. Notably, from 2009 to 2013, 
Dr. Chu was the 12th U.S. Secretary of Energy. As the first scientist to hold this cabinet position and the longest serving energy secretary, Dr. Chu recruited outstanding scientists and engineers to the Department of Energy, and he began several important initiatives, including ARPA-E, the Advanced Research Projects Agency for Energy, the Energy Innovation Hubs, and was personally tasked by President Obama to assist in stopping the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. Prior to his appointment as Secretary of Energy, Dr. Chu was the director of the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, where he was active in pursuit of alternative and renewable energy technologies. And a member of the Stanford faculty since 1987, Dr. Chu helped launch BioX, a multidisciplinary institute combining the physical and biological sciences with medicine and engineering. And previously, Dr. Chu was head of the quantum electronics research development department at AT&T Bell Labs. Dr. Chu, of course, is the co-recipient of the 1997 Nobel Prize in Physics for his contributions to laser cooling and atom trapping, and he's received numerous other awards, and I will spare you the list tonight. He's a member of the National Academy of Sciences, the American Philosophical Society, and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. And he's a foreign member of the Royal Society, the Royal Academy of Engineering, the Chinese Academy of Sciences, the Korean Academy of Sciences and Technology, and the National Academies of Sciences in Belarus. Dr. Chu completed his undergraduate degree in mathematics and physics at the University of Rochester and holds a PhD in physics from the University of California, Berkeley. He also holds 32 honorary degrees. I don't know if that's a record, but I was impressed. Uh, he became a member of AAAS back in 1995 and was elected as a fellow of AAAS in 2000. At the end of this meeting, Steve will assume the role of chair of the AAAS Board of Directors. And it is my great pleasure now to welcome you, Dr. Chu, to the stage. All right, thank you very much, Peggy. Um, I just want to tell the staffers of the AAAS, it's uh, five minutes to six. <laughs> so I'm going to talk about envisioning tomorrow and, um, and how we're advancing science and rising above some, several gathering storms. I am not going to talk about the exciting program uh, that's there before you, and, um, and I hope you enjoy it. But I will uh, quote the greatest American philosopher of the 20th century to lead this off. Just in case you're wondering who that is, it's Yogi Berra, who on the right-hand side is seen in a philosophical conversation. <laughs> and he said many, many wise things, but it's tough to make predictions, especially about the future, is um, very telling for this theme. I, what, what is rising above the Ganymede Storm? I'm going to get a little bit more into this, but just to remind you, I was privileged to serve on this committee that wrote the report chaired by Norm Augustine and um, uh, also a revisiting of the Gathering Storm. But let me go, just move on quickly to the AAAS. And I want to give very personal visions of how I think we can improve things. So this, I am not speaking as the president of the AAAS. I am not speaking for the board. I am not speaking for the staff. It's just me. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about science policy. I want to talk about science communication, uh, dissemination of science to a larger audience, and reaching a growing membership. In fact, uh, my ambitions are large. Uh, I would love to grow the membership by about tenfold. Why tenfold? But physicists think in orders of magnitude. <laughs> and so um, one of the things we are very proud of at the AAAS is that we uh, coordinate the Science and Technology Policy Fellowship Program. And this is where we link scientists. Typically, they're young PGs, graduate students who've just gotten their degrees and, and want to actually learn more about the federal government, but also use their expertise to give advice to the federal government. 
Most of the science fellows are supported by federal agencies, but there are 35 or so uh, fellows, maybe 38, that are supported that go to Congress because the congressional offices typically cannot afford to pay even a postdoctoral salary. And so the AAAS supports two of these congressional fellows. And I would love to see, and I'm working towards raising contributions to announce, endow six fellows, because we pay for these fellows out of our operating budget. OK, another thing that I would like to talk about is science communication. AAAS runs Sciline. You may not know about it, but I'm going to introduce you to it. Well, I'm not going to. Uh, and this is the thing in their website. Your story involves science. You need an expert. You need that expert now. And so I'm going to introduce you to Rick Weiss, the director. Welcome, of everyone, Sci to this Sideline Media Briefing on the Future of Food, a particularly fun media briefing today featuring uh, three experts uh, looking at different aspects of what we might be eating in the years to come, and for some of us already. Uh, before we get started, I just want to take one minute to introduce Sideline to those of you who may not be familiar with us. We are a philanthropically funded free service for reporters with one overarching mission, which is to help you get more research-based evidence into your news stories. Okay, so that's Sideline, and uh, it, it's one of the things I'm very proud of, the AAAS and, and the board uh, are very proud of. Another thing we do is in the front section of Science Magazine, we publish daily, weekly and daily uh, uh, things. And this is from a weekly thing where you can click on it, you get this picture, and this is, uh, you can get news stories like uh, uh, Mission Impossible, how does the uh, World Health Organization director fight to prevent a pandemic without offending China, and how it's going about. Um, just, I want to pause a little bit briefly, take a little detour, and just remind you uh, the coronavirus is worrisome, but it, the mother of all viruses was the Spanish influenza pandemic of 2018-2019. It was named the Spanish flu by the French, who had more political control. And it originated in France. And uh, it infected about 27% of the entire world population and the estimate it has killed three to six percent of the entire world population. The 2009 H1N1 virus, it's related to the Spanish flu, originated in Mexico and the United States, and it's estimated by the CDC to have killed between 150 and nearly 600,000 people. Okay? <laughs> uh, so what has happened? Well, the internet has happened. <laughs> And so you, one has to keep this in mind. And then there's another fear that the experts uh, are worried about. There's an Asian avian flu. It's called H5N1. Uh, there is a new outbreak uh, in the last couple of days in China. It's transmitted among birds. Very weak transmission to people. But if a person gets it, they have a 60% chance of dying. So we have other problems. Let me go to some cheerful news uh, about science communication. Uh, science can be fun. And if you look at this cat, this is in the, some of the newsletters that uh, we have. And this is a quote from this. Now a new study shows that cats do, in fact, have facial expressions. Humans just aren't that good at interpreting them. And so 6,000 people were asked whether each cat expression is positive or negative. And it's pretty good. 59% said they correctly identified. But if you're a veterinarian or someone who works a lot with animals, you get more than 75% correct, with leading researchers to dub them cat whispers. Now, this is just fun. And uh, if we can bring this sort of fun of science to more of a general public, it would be great. Now, I want to go on and say that we have a membership. Uh, the membership is um, this is a record of our membership over the past three years. Uh, paid membership is about 100, a little less than 100,000, and the upper curve is all members. OK, the trouble with paid membership and the trouble with many scientists, young scientists, including graduate students and postdocs that I train today, uh, say, well, I don't want to join AAAS and get Science Magazine. I get it free and I hope to be a faculty member, I will still get it free. 
And so I think we need a new business model. This is actively being considered and pursued among the staff. And I just want to do a little advertisement of something I've been saying over the last several board meetings. And what about a Spotify membership model? So my apologies to AAAS. I hope you don't get sued by Spotify. Um, and so maybe for $3 a month to support all the noble missions of the AAAS. I remind you that the American Civil Liberties Union has over a million members, more than about 10 times our membership, that pay at least $35 per year. Um, what do you get? Well, you support the noble mission, you receive an electronic copy of the front end section of science, and I would like to see if we could develop, at very low cost, another front end section that addresses the science can be fun, not only for professional scientists, uh, people who have a real interest in science, but for a more lay audience, including K through 12 people. And so this communication is in my dream of what I want. Um, Unfortunately, you know, you're, as an officer of the AAAS, I'm only here for a very short time. This will take a long time, so I hope uh, the, my successors and uh, the able staff of the AAAS can do this. Um, all right, more about envisioning the future. And so my vision of the future is really shaped by history. And so just to remind you of a very famous saying uh, from a Spanish-American philosopher, those who do not remember the past are condemned to repeat it. Another version of this is a Gan Wilson cartoon which says, you will make the same foolish mistakes you have made before, but not only once, but many, many times. All right, so let me turn the clock back 120 years or more. Uh, and it was the opening inaugural address of Sir William Crookes uh, and it was his uh, address of the president of the British Association for the Advancement of Science. Um, now, I do not want the AAAS stand up like the British Association for the Advancement of Science because many of you, most of you, have never even heard of this. Um, anyway, he began his address by saying, England and all civilized countries are in deadly peril. It is the chemist who must come to the rescue before we're in the actual grip of actual dirt, the chemist will step in and postpone the day of famine. With that address, he set off an international race to see if you can prevent starvation. What was the issue? The issue was we were, uh, natural fertilizer wasn't enough. We were actually getting fertilizer from South America, uh, guano, that's a technical word for bird doo-doo. Uh, that made very, but they're going to run out of this nitrogen-based fertilizer. And so the prediction was in a couple of decades, Europe begins to starve. So that international waste was won first and awarded a Nobel Prize to Fritz Haber in 1918. In 1931, Bosch, who worked with Haber to actually use high pressure uh, um, chemistry to actually make it work practically, got another Nobel Prize for the same work. Uh, and then many years later, Gerhard Erl got a Nobel Prize for his work on heterogeneous catalysis, where it says in the Nobel Prize statement that at last we're beginning to understand the Haber-Bosch process. So two and a half Nobel Prizes. Why? Because it enabled the world to feed itself. All right. Science has done other things. Another really, truly great Nobel Prize in peace was awarded to Norman Borlaug who bred different strains of wheat to develop a disease-resistant dwarf strain of wheat that had the thick stalks and shorter so they can have the heavier kernels. And in this picture, you have the dwarf strains of wheat with the normal wheat. And from this work and the work of fertilizers, you look from 1960, where the population was 3 billion people, to 2005, where the population was 6.5 billion people, the blue and red curves are the production of grains, wheat, rice, corn, around the world. Not in the United States, around the world. The black and, uh, dots are the amount of land put under agricultural cultivation. It remained the same. It actually went down. Okay, so science rose to the challenge. So the question is, will science meet the challenges that we face today? Climate change is the 
800 pound, 8,000 pound gorilla in the room. But there are other challenges like internet, which spreads misinformation very rapidly uh, as a threat to democracy. So let me talk a little bit about climate change. Are the glaciers melting? Is the sea level rising? The short answer is yes. But let's go back and look at history. I'm not going to look at climate models. And so if you go back and look in history, on the right-hand side is the present time. And as you go leftward, you're actually going back in time. And that red line is where we are today in temperature. Oh, I'm sorry. The red line is one and a half degrees to two degrees. I'm being generous, warmer than we are in temperature. And you ask in that last warm period, roughly 125,000 years ago, where was the sea level? It was six to nine meters higher. So that's not, that's not a climate prediction. That's history. We know it's history because we know where the sea levels were because of the fossil records of critters that lived between land and ocean all around the world. And so now we thought this would take several thousand years. But with recent uh, measurements in Antarctica and Greenland and other places, um, many people are now afraid this, most of this rise will occur in less than 250 years. So that's just the beginning. Water aquifers are being depleted in many parts of the world. We see increased droughts, heat waves, forest fires, water shortages, crop failures. And all those things could, in the near-term future, create climate refugees. So if you think of refugees going into Europe, five million or so, think of what would tens of millions to hundreds of millions of people would do. And these are where the water stress shortages are. When I was Secretary of Energy, I talked with the Indian ministers, and they were panic struck that if the rise, sea level rises in Bangladesh, many, many very poor people won't go inland and up in the mountains. They will go across the border. And one of the ministers asked me, what are we going to do? Do we shoot them at the border? OK, so now. This is an IPC set of scenarios of emissions um, on the vertical axis and time uh, on the horizontal axis. Many, many scenarios. So I'm going to do my own scenario. Uh, here's my scenario. I just drew it uh, because I think this is more likely because the emission scenarios to keep us to one and a half, maybe two degrees, require negative world total emissions on all greenhouse gas by 2080. Let me say it again. It requires negative emissions by 2080. But this was actually made a year or two ago, and we're getting so we're in order to keep that, we actually have to have more aggressive negative emissions. A very iconic picture that I talked about uh, for many years, uh, even before our Secretary of Energy, is uh, Earthrise. And it's from Apollo 8 that uh, orbited the moon. And the last orbit, they turned the capsule Earthworm and took this picture. And the astronaut who took the picture said, we came all this way to explore the moon. The most important thing is we've discovered the Earth. Look at this picture. The moon is not a good place to live. No water, no air, no magnetic field, so you get lethal dose of radiation. Earth looks pretty good from this vantage point everywhere around, black. OK, let's talk about it. One of the great discoveries over the last couple of decades was that there are many, many exoplanets, planets outside of our own solar system, estimated uh, to be maybe 10 billion Earth-like planets within the reach of our own galaxy. So this is, uh, on the left-hand side, a picture of a potential Earth-like planet, meaning that the temperature allows liquid water. Uh, and that's a picture of, uh, we think, our Milky Way from afar. Uh, the photographer who took that picture had a very wide-angle lens. <laughs> anyway, this is the radius of, of the Milky Way. We are here over there. And you can do a little calculation. The time to travel one-fifth the radius of the galaxy, which is, gives you a reasonable probability of finding a good planet, will take 45 million years based on a very optimistic orbiting planet boosting that I made, where as the satellite goes around, let's say, Mars, it goes in and gets a little boost up. And it goes around Jupiter, gets another boost up, and Venus, and all this other stuff. You don't get to these high velocities with chemical fuel. 
You use the planet. You slow down the planets a little bit, but you get the boost. Then you're traveling over uh, 70,000 kilometers per second on your way, and it takes you 45 million years to get there. And when you get there, there's no way to slow yourself up and land safely. <laughs> okay? Forget about trashing this planet and moving on to a new world. <laughs> we are here. <laughs> All right. Now, the UN goal to keep the temperature below at one and a half degrees requires we stay below 2,900 gigatons of carbon. This is where that danger line is. I just want to say that we on the y-axis is total cumulative emissions. Why cumulative emissions? Because once you put the carbon dioxide up, half of it get, gets very rapidly absorbed by land and ocean, and the rest of it just circulates land, ocean, and back up again. And the lifetime of the remaining half is estimated to be about 10,000 years. So don't think 2100, think 2112100, another decimal point. Most of the greenhouse gas emissions have occurred since 1950. Yogi Berra did not say that, but he could have. Uh, if you don't change direction, you might end up where you're heading. All right, I'm going to give you a little good news. Uh, technology is happening. The cost of EV batteries has declined tenfold from 2010 to 2020. Uh, if you take where we are in batteries today, and that little dot is the 18650 style battery that Tesla uses for their S1. Uh, the hope is that we can get up to that green circle there. It's not a hope. Uh, I'm on the board of a battery company. I do battery research. And the battery company is now shipping samples uh, with energy densities around double the energy density of current batteries, uh, both in weight and in um, volume. All right, so EVs are projected to increase in sales from where we are today to perhaps by uh, something like uh, even very early, uh, they're projected to be rising in sales. By 2040, it's been projected that perhaps 55% of light duty vehicles uh, would be EVs. Is there enough lithium? And the answer is, turns out there is. We're about to publish a paper uh, that says you can get lithium from seawater in a very practical manner. If you do that, you've just increased the lithium reservoirs about 10,000-fold. Now, solar will continue to go down dramatically, at least another factor of two. And if you go to Africa, uh, and you will see pictures like this, when you walk around and you see people carrying things on their heads. You pe see people carrying water walking kilometers uh, by themselves. You see people pushing bicycles loaded with 100 kilograms of potatoes by themselves. Many of these people are so poor they can't even afford animals to do this. And what would, imagine what would happen if you can bring very cheap solar energy to this population. However, it has to be really cheap and reliable, and, and with solar energy, you can have irrigation and water purification, where many countries, especially in East Africa, don't even have that, let alone uh, transportation. And, but the introduction of very inexpensive but reliable electric two- and three-wheelers is possible. Uh, but for now, we need a new business model, and the little capex really drops down by another fivefold. All right. But this is a possibility, and so maybe you can do this and bootstrap past petroleum-based uh, transportation, just as cell phones did. Another very real possibility is that clean electricity can be less than one and a half cents per kilowatt hour, and it will be, it's already two cents a kilowatt hour in the best solar sites in the Middle East. This is not just my dream. It is the firm prediction of oil companies. I'm an advisor to Royal Dutch Shell, and they are convinced by 2030, 2040, at the latest, renewable energy will be one and a half cents a kilowatt hour. And the petroleum will peak around that time, petroleum use for transportation. And so this really opens up very exciting possibilities if the electricity is so cheap that you can use electrochemistry to make carbon-free hydrogen and other forms of clean energy. Let me move very quickly to agriculture. It turns out 
that more greenhouse gas emissions come from agriculture, land use, forestry, than from all of electricity generation around the world. And so I marked out in the orange and the blue methane, more than half the methane emissions in the world are due to agriculture and animal raising. Most of the N2O is due to fertilizer runoff. And so all this stuff is agriculture. And right now, uh, because of the progress, we actually, more than half of the habitable land around the world is used today for agriculture and grazing. So this is already geoengineering on a grand scale. We've engineered everything we eat. Here's a quiz, I'm a professor. That's some corn, that's another picture of corn. That's another picture of corn. Can you pick out the native corn? It's unrecognizable. And so that has been bred. This is another picture. This is pictures of beef cattle, pigs, and broiler chickens. The full circumference of the circle denotes their natural lifetime. And the red part is when these animals are slaughtered from birth. They've been bred to grow very rapidly. American pigs uh, are slaughtered in roughly 24 weeks from birth, and they weigh 280 pounds. Uh, so this livestock have been really optimized for very rapid growth, and many uh, species, uh, some of the birds well, actually can't go to maturity because they're so disproportionately weighted they can't stand up. Now, another thing about geoengineering. Uh, if you think of all the mammal mass in the world, and on one side you put in wild animals, mice, rats, wild deer, buffalo, tigers and, tigers and bears, on the other side, you put people and the animals we eat. It turns out that 96% of the mammal mass are us. 96% are us. We have truly engineered the world. We've engineered the animals. These are domestic turkeys, three and a half months of slaughter. Uh, they are so breast heavy, they can't mate. So they're made by, uh, mated through artificial insemination. All right? And we don't, so that's three and a half month old turkeys. They look very different than wild turkeys of unknown ages. I can only tell you how old this wild turkey is. <laughs> 101 is eight years old. Okay, think of the emissions. Uh, China and the United States lead the world in emissions. Ch both China and the United, China is double the United States now, but uh, the United States is more than the EU 28. If you look at just beef and dairy cattle, if they were a country, the greenhouse gases from beef and dairy cattle would be more greenhouse gas emissions than the entire EU 28. I should say EU 27 plus Great Britain. All right? <laughs> this is a significant part of greenhouse gas emissions. And the good news is that there are developing very rapidly vegetable-based meat things that could uh, have hopefully gain traction uh, and personal favor among the taste. Younger people are gravitating towards that very rapidly. Um, there is other good news that's happening. Uh, there's a startup company called Pivot Bio that's already started not only field testing, but it's now commercially been made available to some selected farmers where corn and the microbes on the seeds of the corn have been such that if, when you plant the corn, the microbes uh, interact with the corn and make the corn fertilizer, nitrogen-based fertilizer. And so the picture on the right is nitrogen-based fertilizer from corn, which greatly reduces the need for energy to make ammonia to make fertilizer, but also greatly re reduces the N2O runoff, also a big problem with algae blooms as well as greenhouse gases. But if you really want a sustainable world, the world population cannot increase forever. This is not rocket science. And however, economic, increased economic prosperity and global competitiveness in all countries is based on having more young people, more young workers support a smaller, older population. All right? This is known as a Ponzi scheme or pyramid scheme to cut through all the other stuff. Now, uh, it was noted by our sponsor, uh, there's a new Hans Rosling Center, and uh, so I'm gonna show you some data there. If you don't know this website called Gapminder, you should explore it. It's fantastic. 
And so using that, I plotted on the y-axis uh, fertility rate, and on the x-axis uh, income, uh, average income of each country. You can pick any country you want, so I happen to pick India, Mexico, and the United States. And the dashed line is what you need for flat population, no growth, no shrinkage. And you see the United States is below that. You see that Mexico has gone, Germany, sorry, has gone below that. Mexico has gone below that. India, which is not a rich country, mean, mean average income in US dollars is less than $8,000 a year. It is now at 2.2 to 2.3 fertility rate. So you don't even have to be rich to have, stop having babies. Why that is, is uh, something of great debate. I can offer, you know, uh, women's education, uh, lighting at night, something else to do at night, uh, and like late night TV and other things. But that, that's just theory. Uh, the fact is <laughs> that uh, it's working. Uh, even in Africa, it's beginning to work, except in East Africa, where the fertility rate is still five, six, and seven uh, per woman. But the hope is very, very quickly, as you bring them out of poverty, this goes down very rapidly because you don't want to pay for that many of your kids' college educations. Anyway, all right, we need a strategy how to increase prosperity in developing and developed countries with declining populations. And we need a different measure of wealth. Because as long as the measure of wealth is GDP, that means you're driven to increase production and consumption of stuff. One car per family is not good enough. Two cars per family is good enough. Two car, one car per adult. One uh, vehicle is the average in American adults if you have a number of vehicles in America, including delivery trucks, taxis, and adults, it's one to one in the US. All right? Do we want it to be two to one? Do we want China to be one to one, which is one in 20? And the answer is no. We have to redefine what we mean by wealth. And so think of what you treasure. Uh, it should be quality of health, including your health in old age. It should be education, including continued and renewal education, lowering of stress levels, connections, and family and friends. So we need to get onto these metrics before, otherwise we're going to be chasing, making, and consuming more stuff. On my remaining hour, I'm going <laughs> to talk about a few things. I'm going to talk about immigrants and how they've added immensely to our scientific and technological excellence. And I'm going to report on a few other things. So let me talk about immigrants. The United States is a country of immigrants. And the brain gains we've had in science was stimulated by political events that were gifts to American science. And think of Germany and Italy in the 1930s and early 1940s. Think of China as the Communist Revolution was taking over. Um, my parents came to the United States during World War II uh, to go to graduate school at MIT. Uh, after the Communists took over, they couldn't go back. They would be killed. My mother's father was a president of a major university. He had to exit for his life with nothing besides his life because he too would have been killed. My, that's my mother's father. My father's father uh, was going to be killed, but they didn't get to the Shanghai area in time. He died of natural causes, so they did the only logical thing. They killed the oldest male child at the time in the family who happened to be 21. So there are these gifts. Uh, the Cultural Revolution, Tiananmen Square, the Soviet Union allowed Jewish immigration. And also, in the last more than half century, graduate students and postdocs in foreign countries came to study in the United States and stayed because we're a free, open, and accepting society. And these students became US citizens, raised their families here, as my parents did. They, I don't speak Chinese. They, at the time, they said, we, you're going to grow up confused. We only want you to hear English. So they only spoke to us in English as I, we were growing up. All right. So let me remind you of immigrant contributions to American science. 143 immigrants in the United States have won Nobel Prizes. That's 3%, 3 4% of all laureates. 
That's if you count the first generation, but I'm second generation. If you count the second generation, which is harder to count, it's probably over 50%. All physics Nobel Prizes uh, of laureates born in China came into the United States, got their PhDs, and got Nobel Prizes in the United States. There's something magical about the education system in the United States. If you look between, what is this, 2007 and 2019, the green are foreign laureates, Nobel laureates all around the world, except in the United States. The yellow are native-born U.S. laureates, and the green or whatever color that is, the light green, is foreign-born U.S. laureates. This is staggering. My wife is Welsh, uh, and she was particularly irritated in 2016 that five of the no nine Nobel laureates in the United States and one sort of Nobel Prize in economic science uh, were British-born and British educated with PhDs in Great Britain, but they started their careers in the US because of better opportunities. Okay, immigrants played an essential role in our national defense. Uh, if you look at the immigrants who work in the Manhattan Project, it's a kind of an, um, an all-star list of um, many, most of them, many of them Nobel laureates, uh, and the ones in red, Enrico Fermi, James Frank, Leo Szilard, Eugene Wigner, uh, happened to be working in one University of Chicago metallurgical lab, all right? If you look at immigrant uh, contributions in business, of the 44 of the top 100 Fortune, so-called Fortune 500 companies, 45% uh, were founded by immigrants or children. Includes Intel, Andy Grove, it includes Google, Sergey Brin, includes Amazon, Jeff Bezos, second generation Cuban, Tesla, Elon Musk, first generation South African, Yahoo, NVIDIA, and so on. So the contributions were enormous. And um, I now town turn to a recent report. Uh, it was commissioned by the National Science Foundation. Uh, it was on fundamental research security 